right. Uh, thanks, A.B. Um, uh, all right. And thank you all so much for, for joining today and for the you know, significant interest in challenge trials. Um, I just put the recording on to so just know the calls being recorded. And um, uh, yeah, so it's been an exciting uh, couple of days in challenge study news. And um, I should manage expectations a bit about um, what types of questions we're going to be able to talk about on this, this press conference and what kind of information we can provide. Um, so I think, um, you know, the, as you know, you've, you've probably seen and as you've kind of seen from your own sources in, in trying to confirm some of the things if the British government efforts, you know, this was an announcement. Um, this wasn't, you know, the, the announcement itself was not something that we were privy to or have special information uh, about at one day sooner. Um, and, you know, since it was an announcement that they were planning on rolling out for next week, um, you know, a lot of the people we've been talking to um, behind the scenes have asked us not to kind of comment specifically and giving sort of private information that we have. And so most of what we're going to talk about today is really going to be about to, to answer questions about challenge studies in general and provide information about the value of those studies um, and, you know, kind of what public reporting exists. Uh, about the different, the various different challenge trial uh, preparation efforts. Um, the one thing I can say, you know, kind of based on sort of private information, um, is that the reporting, you know, we've been talking with um, representatives of the um, British government's effort to explore preparation for challenge trials for a number of months now. Uh, and so in that sense, you know, while we, we were not uh, aware ahead of time, about this particular announcement, um, you know, that news does not come as a surprise to us. And I think it's consistent with the idea that the UK government is interested in these studies and potentially funding these studies. And, and those are things that are, have been publicly reported. Um, and I can also say, you know, based on those discussions, I think that the, um, the timeline that's been outlined from a British, you know, government led efforts uh, to start doing challenge studies in January uh, is realistic from, from their particular perspective. Now, there are other preparation efforts uh, in different, you know, different statuses that have been publicly announced before. Um, there's been public discussion of Oxford and Johnson & Johnson and the NIH. Um, and so it's not obvious to me that the first challenge study would be the study that the Financial Times reported on. Uh, but obviously, it's, it's an important moment, and we expect to hear uh, more about that. Um, in the future, you know, a, a couple other things I just want to raise and mention just as kind of context for this announcement and for challenge studies in general. Um, and the first is kind of the, the use of challenge studies. And in particular, I think something that's been under discussed, we really want to emphasize, which is the value of challenge studies in helping to prove um, second generation vaccines and treatments and to try to get, you know, as many vaccines with proven effectiveness and safety to be approved and particularly so that they can be meeting the need um, in the developing world, in low and middle income countries. We one day sooner think that's uniquely valuable and that has been kind of left out of the discussion about the ethics of challenge studies, which is that to vaccinate the world, we're gonna need something like 16 billion doses of vaccines and the, the candidates currently in phase three aren't gonna be able to, to provide that supply. And we shouldn't be treating people in low income countries or middle income countries as fundamentally different from wealthy countries. And it would be a shame if our strategy for vaccine development um, only was aimed at getting, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, ending COVID-19 pandemic in 2021 in wealthy countries, but not in poorer countries. And we think challenge studies um, have a significant role to play there. And you'll hear more about this from some of the different experts um, we're going to talk in a minute, but just, just to, you know, quickly, I think um, you know, some of the major roles of challenge studies are first going to be in prioritizing which vaccine candidates to reach uh, in the second generation to reach phase three, because you obviously cannot do 30,000 person trials for the 160 plus uh, vaccine candidates under development. And so having a sense ahead of time of are these very likely to work is gonna be very valuable in that way. Also, if transmission declines or if it becomes difficult to get a number of um, people to participate in phase three, then challenge studies can prove efficacy in that context. So for example, for the vaccine uh, Vaxcora, challenge studies proved efficacy um, uh, without having to do a separate phase three um, for that particular candidate. And the other thing, another thing that hasn't been emphasized as much in challenge study discussions is its role in helping prove the efficacy of treatments um, especially prophylactic use of treatments. So for example, challenge studies um, were used for Tamiflu, 
uh, in this purpose. And so things like monoclonal antibodies that you might give to people in, for example, a nursing home when someone's been um, infected uh, to try to prevent people from getting infected, uh, that's a lot easier to test in challenge studies than it would be to test with natural infection. Um, and the final thing I'll mention about the use of challenge studies uh, is their scientific value, which has a number of dimensions. And one of the major dimensions is identifying what are called correlates of protection. What does the immune response look like um, when it's going to be effective? Because if you can uh, tell that ahead of time, then if you see that a vaccine produces those correlates of protection, um, you can have a much better sense of, oh, this vaccine is likely to work. And maybe you can even approve a vaccine who's had safety um, proven based on correlates of protection rather than efficacy. And because challenge studies let you observe infection um, from the moment of exposure, they're uniquely valuable in improving these correlates of protection. And they can also be valuable in proving things like um, how long does immunity last, either from natural infection or from a vaccine or other important elements of, of disease. So for all these reasons, uh, we were very pleased to see this announcement uh, or this, this news in the Financial Times uh, about preparations for challenge studies moving forward. And we look forward to more details um, of that becoming publicly available. The final thing I'll say um, before turning it over to AB to, to have some of the different experts um, give their perspective is about our upcoming petition campaign uh, in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, we're still waiting on final approval uh, for the text so this can, can start being signed. It's been a little frustrating getting that. But um, the, the goal of this campaign is to ask for the creation of a challenge study center um, by the UK government that would have enough capacity to be able to, to house about 100 to 200 people at a time. And we think this is uniquely valuable for a few reasons. First, if we're gonna try to test a number of different vaccine candidates and make challenge studies as useful as possible, we're gonna need significant biocontainment capacity to do that. We think that's a real priority because you know, we want to make sure that every risk that a challenge volunteer is taking is getting the most, the most absolute benefit. We think that's an important uh, aspect of respecting challenge volunteers and the challenge volunteer sacrifice. And so, you know, if volunteers are going to be doing infectious dosing studies, hopefully before the end of this year, but likely as um, uh, by, by the beginning of next year, um, then we want to make sure that, that, those, you know, that those risks to develop this challenge model, that that challenge model is utilized as effectively and, and widely as, as possible, and that biocontainment capacity isn't a limiting factor. Because as the name of our organization implies, you know, every day counts. But there's also a longer term importance of developing this challenge study center and of our petition campaign to do so, which is fighting, preparing for future pandemics um, and developing challenge capacity in the future. Um, you know, for example, uh, there's a, an experts at the National Institutes of Health in the United States recommended the preparation of challenge doses back in early March. Now, if that preparation had begun then, and a dosing study might have begun, let's say, in June or July, we might be testing the vaccines, uh, uh, the effectiveness of vaccines with challenges today and be getting answers in about a month, which would clearly be very valuable. And so we think it's important for the future to have a system in place that practically would allow us to sort of um, uh, to, to do those preparations right from the beginning. And then we can look at the ethical considerations. You know, if you could do a challenge study tomorrow, you know, what are the key concerns around that? What should be done or shouldn't be done? I think at the moment, combining the sort of ethical questions of, well, you know, will this, will this work? Is this a good idea? With questions of, well, practically, how long will this take? I think that uh, diminishes both conversations and I think it has significantly delayed uh, the implementation of challenge studies. Um, so, and the other thing, I'll, the final thing I'll say about the Challenge Study Center concept is that there's significant value in fighting infectious disease outside of pandemics or before pandemics happen. So, for example, um, there are a number of scientists who are working on a universal flu vaccine. Uh, there's a number of promising approaches to that vaccine. And challenge studies are uniquely valuable in uh, assessing candidates and different approaches. And so we think that, a, a, we, we believe that governments around the world um, should, for, as a way of preparing for the next pandemic, be the, uh, researching these infectious diseases now, be researching vaccines now, so that ideally, you know, in a perfect world, we could fight a sort of war on flu, and in 10 years have a universal flu vaccine that could significantly decrease the chances of another pandemic like COVID that was based on, um, on a strain of influenza. And we think that a challenge study center would be very valuable for that. Um, okay, so with that, I will turn it back over to AB, who can get you some uh, different statements from some of the experts we have here, and then we will start taking your questions.
Thank you, Josh. Yeah, I'm, we are very honored to have a few um, experts on the call who can speak um, just very briefly about challenge studies. Just one thing I'll add is that in May, uh, the World Health Organization in their uh, paper on the ethical criteria for challenge studies noted that public engagement is an ethical prerequisite for challenge studies. And I think that's one of the reasons we, you know, Wandy Sooner works closely with, with, with scientists to try and inform the public discourse. And the, again, the function of this press conference is to, you know, uh, give, give high quality information, both from experts as well as volunteers about their perspectives on challenge studies and less to comment um, on anything that's not already on the record from the Financial Times and the Telegraph about, about the news today. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll just introduce the, um, the experts that we have on the call. So we have, uh, very pleased to have Dominic Wilkinson, um, who is a professor of medical ethics um, at, at the University of Oxford. Carla Holloway, who is a professor of English and law at Duke University. Um, Daniel Wickler, who is a professor of population ethics and population health at Harvard University, as well as Sir Richard Roberts, um, who's the chief scientific officer, officer at New England Biolabs and a Nobel laureate in, in medicine. Um, so perhaps we can uh, just, just go in that order. Um, if if uh, Dominic, if you want to begin, maybe just by saying a couple thoughts on challenge studies. Thanks very much, Abby. Uh, so uh, I'm a, a medical ethicist. I'm also a medical doctor. I work as a consultant in the NHS, and I have supported one day soon as campaign because I think uh, challenge studies offer a real opportunity um, to accelerate vaccine development, to accelerate identification of the most effective vaccine. They're not only ethical in my view, they're an ethical imperative. Uh, and I think the, the announcement this week that the UK is advanced in its plans and preparations for a challenge trial is exciting news, is positive news for all of us. Uh, who are living through this pandemic and hoping uh, to live beyond it. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Holloway, if, if you'd like to say a couple words about um, your, your sport of challenge studies. Yeah, hello, I'm glad to be here as well and to um, have supported from the beginning One Day Sooner's efforts, both in terms of community engagement and community education. My particular interest as an ethicist is to make certain that diverse voices are both a part of this conversation and a part of the um, trials. And although I have written critically about clinical trials before in our history, I want to be certain to underscore the importance of having diverse, the autonomy of diverse populations respected and our ability and interest in participating underscored. And so my interest is twofold, both in supporting the efforts of One Day Sooner, because I actually believe that the consequences of um, even One Day Sooner will be particularly important to populations of minority and underserved um, communities. And also, I think these minority and underserved communities cannot be pathologized out of a research paradigm. And instead, our autonomy and authority included, included in a paradigm such as this. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Wickler, if you want to say a few words. I believe you're on mute. Okay. Uh, I've been heartened by uh, the um, insistence of One Day Sooner on thoroughly engaging with the science and also the public discussion of these issues. And thirdly, in really uh, thoroughly uh, exploring the complex ethical issues. Um, it, they are acting very responsibly, very cautiously, and um, developing a, a new avenue of uh, progress in uh, human subjects' trials for important diseases. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's they're a, a kind of model for us. So um, it's uh, been something that I've applauded. Um, I, I think it's inevitable that, that some members of the public are going to feel a little uneasy about this. Um, there are young people who are now healthy and they're exposing themselves to an infection that um, they might have avoided otherwise. And, and so the question is, if any of them are injured, is this just something that had to happen and how should we feel about that? Uh, if we understand this as a, um, a kind of patriotic or, or humanitarian impulse that is not so different from other things that people do that we accept, um, 
and uh, things that are comparable or, uh, risk or even greater risk, I think we can eventually uh, come to see that this is uh, not only meritorious, but um, uh, something to applaud. And I certainly would join those who do that. Thank you so much, Professor Wickler. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Sir Richard Roberts. And after that, uh, Professor Nir Eyal, who I uh, forgot to introduce originally. Um, Nir Eyal wrote one of the, uh, wrote, wrote, co-wrote the first paper proposing COVID-19 human challenge trials. Uh, but first, uh, Sir Richard, if you'd like to just say a few words. Sure. Um, I, I think the reason I support this is not because I feel I have any special expertise in either medicine or challenge trials. But just as a scientist, it is clear that a challenge trial is the best way to get the data to find out whether a vaccine works and it's the best way to get it quickly. We're very familiar with people who volunteer for things that are inherently dangerous, um, like people who join the military. And I think the key to any challenge trial to getting volunteers is to make sure that we inform them completely about what the problems are, what the problems might be, and have a good assurance that they understand the risk they're taking. I think if we do this properly, and I think our ethicists are in a great position to advise on that, then I think challenge trials are clearly the most sensible way to go to get a quick result as to whether a vaccine is effective or not. Thank you so much, Sir Richard. And Professor Eyal, if you'd like to say a few words. Can you hear me? I wanted to add um, that um, um, co-authors and I now have a paper under consideration that shows that if human infection studies accelerate vaccine development by one to eight months, as recent calculations by others propose, then they would avert the loss of between 720,000 to 5 million and 760,000 years of life. And anywhere between 40 to 320 million years in poverty, dire poverty worldwide, most of which would be concentrated in the developing world. Uh, this estimate is conservative, it's based on um, um, others' um, analysis of uh, World Bank and other standard figures. It fails to take into account many challenges, many channels through which an accelerated path to herd immunity and to the sustainable end to this uh, pandemic um, would also affect lives and um, economies around the world. So the real numbers are probably actually above that. So, um, one more point. Uh, one concern that many people have about challenge trials done soon is that we don't yet have a true rescue therapy. That's the word often used. Um, for the rare, rare event in which even these young volunteers, uh, free from any comorbidities, um, may develop severe disease and need help. Um, as an ethicist, um, the main point of having a rescue therapy is to reduce the risk that something really terrible happens. But we already have a mechanism that reduces these risks very substantially, namely through the selection of only people who are young adults with very few comorbidities, once you select only this population for trial participation, and of course, with their fully informed consent for any remaining risks, you're already talking about levels of risk, which are according to a calculation, but one, by one day sooner, and I looked at the details, and to me, they seem very cogent, about um, 125th of the risk from kidney donation, uh, which is live kidney donation, which is a practice that everybody accepts uh, as safe enough because it carries risks, but the risks are tolerable given the consent of the donor and the help to one adult. But we're talking here about momentous help to many, many people in need around the world. And um, uh, that to me really justifies uh, conducting trials that would get us to a vaccine sooner. Thank you so much. Um, so we, we are actually right on schedule. I do want to um, definitely leave some time for press Q&A, but we are 
Um, also pleased to be joined by some British One Day Sooner volunteers, uh, people who would be willing to actually take part um, in a challenge trial um, once recruitment, if and when recruitment begins. Uh, so I just want to turn it over to a few volunteers to, to say a few words. Uh, maybe Sean, if, if, if you want to begin. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for everyone coming and thanks to the experts for joining in particular. Uh, so I'm a graduate student at the University of Oxford and uh, very briefly why I signed up was like everyone else, uh, I wanted to help, but unlike in particular the experts here, I couldn't help by doing research myself. Um, but thankfully I'm young and healthy, so uh, at least I could give my time and energy in order to help the research. So the main motivation was to end the pandemic as soon as possible, I suppose. And I imagine many here share this ambition. We wouldn't be here otherwise. So I'll pass on to whoever the next volunteer AB chooses is. Thanks, John. Um, Estefania, if you want to say a few words. Um, yeah, hi. Um, I just felt that um, I had a responsibility um, with, I come from a third world country, so I understand how pandemics and like this kind of diseases work in this kind of environment so I currently I'm in the UK I'm young um, I don't have any underlying conditions and if this can save lives then I just felt that it was something I had to do thank you thanks, thanks. thank you so much Estefania um, Danica if you want to say a few words um hi uh, i want to volunteer as part of this trial because I want this pandemic to be over. I think everyone does. And personally, I've known some people in some horrible, horrible situations. Um, one of my best friends lost both of her grandparents early in the pandemic and she couldn't be there to say goodbye. And so many people are struggling with that, not able to have that closure and grieving. And <sighs> You can't really hold a proper funeral with the people you love to celebrate the people who we have lost during this pandemic until we have a vaccine, until everyone is safe to travel freely. So I want to help bring that day one day sooner. Thank you, Danica. Um, Paul Vandenbosch, who donated his kidney to a stranger, if you want to say a, a couple words about why you're interested in potentially, um, you know, expressing interest in taking part in the challenge study. Um, I think the motivation for wanting to donate a kidney and, and wanting to participate in a, a challenge trial are very similar, and I, I note that others uh, in the team have, have also done so. But um, I, I also want to make a plea at this point to consider older people as potential. Um, as you might, I might gather from the color of my hair, I'm not a young person anymore. Um, I'm in my 60s, very fit. But I think that there is, while in the first instance, I guess young people are likely to be selected, um, what I would also ask is that serious consideration be given to the kinds of information that we need, because after all, the majority of people who are vulnerable to disease are older people and so it's important that we get information uh, about immune responses and the immunity that's generated by any vaccine from an older group of people um, and people such as myself may be at slightly additional risk to a younger person but nevertheless might have value to offer and I would ask that that be seriously considered in any future challenge trial. Thank you so much, Paul. It, yes, well, while well, well, it is the case that the early challenge studies are likely only to include people who are young and healthy, the sort of outpouring of support from people who are older and willing to take part in a challenge study with Wendy Stooner has been uh, breathtaking and, and, and really admirable. Um, and then lastly, before we kick it over to the press for a Q&A, uh, just to Alistair, who is the author of uh, Wendy Sooner's uh, forthcoming petition um, in support of preparing uh, facilities for challenge studies. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi. So, yeah, I'm Alistair. Um, uh, I've actually deferred university a year, uh, kind of, which was somewhat to do with my work with One Day Sooner. Uh, so I think uh, Josh has covered the petition in, um, in plenty enough detail. Um, like I say, we're, that's currently under review. Uh, we're not entirely sure what the review process, um, kind of where it is now, um, but um, crossing our fingers that that's live um, very soon. 
Um, so yeah, we think it's really important for uh, biocontainment, not just for this pandemic, and even if it's not ready for maybe these first few challenge trials, um, that's not really a problem uh, because there will be, you know, there's many different vaccines that would benefit from a challenge trial test, um, all of which would need kind of need the space. And as Josh said, it could be used for, for more challenge trials going forward. Um, so we're really, really keen to see um, or at least do what we can to get something like this built. So the, the parliamentary petition is, is a good way forward. Um, another thing to note is that the advantage of running it uh, on the government site is that if we get 10,000 signatures, the government have to respond in writing uh, and 100,000 signatures, unless there's a very clear reason not to, which there isn't, I don't think, the government have to debate it in Parliament. Cool. Th thank you so much, Alistair. So now uh, we'd, I'd, we'd like to open it, uh, open the floor to press Q and A. Um, this can be, well, we'll see how this goes. Both, you know, people can submit questions to the Zoom chat publicly. You can direct your question at uh, volunteers or, or a specific expert or, or Josh, um, or you can, we can try it sort of popcorn style where uh, journalists, if you have a question, you can uh, just unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Uh, yes, yeah, so our, our first question is to uh, Professor Nir Ayal, if you could just uh, repeat the figures um, that you gave when you were discussing your study that's currently under consideration. Nir may be away from the computer at the moment, uh, so we can take an, another question in the meantime. We can have him maybe email them to, to Nicola after the after the call. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. Is it going to go? Hi, um, Adam, uh, Japanese broadcaster TV Asahi. Um, I was just wondering, of the 37,000 people I think you said you'd um, recruited so far, um, how many of those um, were Japanese, do you know? And um, of the Japanese volunteers, do you know which uh, center they would be tested at? Any in the UK? Any in the UK at all? So with regards to the number of specific, uh, specifically Japanese volunteers, I can pull that up in a moment. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll get you that number. Um, and with regards to testing, maybe uh, Josh, you want to take that one. Um, I, will, I will mention that um, the, the information that we have about forthcoming challenge trials in the UK um, is, is all in, uh, you know, all publicly available information that's in the Telegraph and Financial Times. But Josh, if you wanted to say anything more. Yeah, so, so there's not any plans, um, there, there are no Japanese facilities that I'm aware of that have um, publicly discussed doing, doing challenge studies. Um, and so, you know, I think it is unlikely that folks who live in Japan are going to be in the kind of first wave of challenge studies. I suspect that, that once um, the first study has been done and the model is, has been developed, um, I suspect that, um, uh, you know, there'll be more enthusiasm from, from different countries. Um, there's already, a, we have actually a Canadian petition and there's Canadian members of parliament um, who have been adva advancing challenge studies in Canada. Um, but I think that, you know, for, for the immediate future, if I were Japanese and interested in being in a challenge study, um, I wouldn't expect to be able to participate until um, at the very earliest, um, probably the second quarter of 2021. Um, but, you know, we, we don't, you know, completely know yet what that is going to look like in, uh, in 2021. Um, and there is a world, I think, again, for the first studies is unlikely, but there is a world in which people might travel outside of their um, home region in order to participate in a study, um, though I do think that's probably unlikely for the, the first wave of, of studies. Thank you so much, Josh. Could I just ask you to um, read out what um, Abe's just kindly put into the, to the chat there about the 55 people oh, from okay. Japan that have signed up? Uh, sure, sure. So, um, so 55 people from Japan have signed up with One Day Sooner, um, expressing interest in taking part in a COVID-19 immune challenge study. Thank you. And do you know where they would, sorry, do you know where they would um, take part at this stage or not? In, in Japan, I don't. Um, I don't know which facilities exist in Japan or what, um, what that could look like. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so uh, a question from Rebecca Hartman. Um, are your volunteers confirmed to take part in the UK challenge trial? Um, Josh, do you want to take this one as well? Uh, yeah, and the answer to that is no. There hasn't been any challenge. There hasn't been, um, to my knowledge, 
any sort of protocol for a challenge study that's been submitted for regulatory and ethical approval and approved. And before you can have um, a, before, before a, um, a study could start recruiting research participants, they would need to have that approval. Um, and so, uh, yeah, as far as we know, uh, there's no reason to believe that, that there's been a pro uh, protocol like that approved and um, we're not aware of any, any active um, research participant uh, recruitment going on yet. Thanks. The, the next question is from Nicola Hill. I'll also pass it to Josh, which is any idea which vaccine candidate is likely to be used? Um, so the, uh, so no, um, the, is the, the short answer to that. I think that one thing to realize is that the first studies um, in, a, in a challenge study need to be uh, what are called infectious dosing studies, um, or what the World Health Organization calls uh, stage one studies. And that's where you're testing the virus and not the vaccine and you're figuring out the right uh, dose of the virus to give to people that's going to get reliably uh, a certain percentage, ideally something like 70 to 80% infected, um, but also not be producing severe, severe disease. Um, and so that, that challenge study has to happen first. Um, I think there's been a little bit of lack of public clarity about the, the January announcement and, and how that fits. But I would expect, um, you know, so that study has to be done and then there can be um, vaccines being tested and we don't have um, any sort of confirmation or anything about which, which vaccines would be tested. Um, I can say based on kind of public, um, uh, publicly reported information that uh, Johnson & Johnson has um, been preparing a viral strain for use in challenge studies whether they will do challenge studies is, isn't something you know that, that I know or that's been, been publicly reported. And similarly, you know, there's there's been discussions around Oxford around doing those studies. But I will say that um, I think that Oxford's doing challenge studies isn't really an indication that Oxford's vaccine would be tested in challenge studies. I think a lot of the interest among um, not just the British government group but also Oxford and others is not necessarily testing their own vaccine candidate, but developing a model to test future vaccine candidates and to learn things about the disease. And insofar as the, va the Oxford vaccine candidate could be tested in a, in a challenge study, I suspect it, it might be in a situation where a year or two from now, it's, it's being tested to, to figure out how long uh, it provides immunity or, or things, like, things like that. Um, so yeah, unfortunately right now we don't um, have uh, information about which vaccine candidate or candidates are likely to be tested. Uh, great. The, the next question um, that I'll also let, let Josh take first is just from Haley Ott, which is, uh, does One Day Sooner do anything to ensure diversity in challenge trials, specifically in regards to COVID-19 challenge trials? Um, you can take some of these AV too, or we can have some of our volunteers. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so the answer to this is yes. Um, we have made uh, significant efforts to make sure that we are connecting with our volunteers of, of color and, and uh, our kind of our diverse population. Um, so, so actually right before this call, uh, we had a town hall with some of our African volunteers, um, some of whom have uh, written pieces in the South Africa Sunday Times and Modern Ghana about their interest in, in challenge studies. And so I think there, there's kind of a couple different elements of um, diversity in challenge studies. I think one is kind of cross-national diversity and then one is within nations. So we have a very diverse group um, across, across nations. We have volunteers from over 162 countries. Um, but it is true that, that you know, in um, you know, America, for example, where about 40 plus percent, I think, of our volunteers are from, you know, that, that population is more, uh, more white than the general population of, of the country. And so we think it's important to be, you know, both highlighting the voices um, of people who are who um, are diverse in our in our volunteer population. And I actually have, um, uh, or actually, yeah. So we, it's important to do that. And also, we want to be um, connecting with uh, researchers and others um, to to discuss and, and talk about racial equity in vaccination. Um, we've done a couple events uh, um, with that particularly a event um, on a panel um, with experts from St. Louis University and Howard University on racial equity and vaccination, and uh, a couple different events um, that are debates about challenge studies uh, with, with the Rikers Debate Project, um, uh, trying to kind of reach some, some more um, kind of vulnerable communities. So it's definitely an issue that, that we care about, that we think is important, that we wanna make sure there's diversity in these studies. Um, and you know, I think like anyone, our, our efforts certainly aren't perfect. 
Um, but we've, we've been um, doing the best we can to ensure that the population of people in a, in a challenge study is going to be um, sufficiently diverse so that we have the results are going to be generalizable beyond any specific uh, population. Yeah, thanks so much, Josh. I'll just add that I linked in the chat uh, two pieces written by One Day Sooner volunteers, one by Felix Abouagye, who is a Ghanaian volunteer who discussed the importance um, or, or his desire to take part in a challenge trial, both um, to, you know, to, to, to help humanity and also as, as a Ghanaian um, wanting to ensure um, diversity and African participation in vaccine development, as well as a piece I, I co-wrote with Bonelli Kunene, who is a One Day Sooner volunteer from South Africa, and Mabel Rosenheck, who uh, works with One Day Sooner on vaccine equity. She's a, a historian at Temple University about the need for anti-racist vaccine development specifically, and especially in the context of COVID-19 human challenge trials. Um, I know that our, our experts might have something to add on, on this point, and so as well as our volunteers uh, on the on the points about diversity in, in challenge trials and vaccine development more broadly. So I'll open the floor just for a moment um, if anyone wishes to also comment on this. Um, and if not, we can move on to the next press question. Can I just make a comment briefly and that this is a problem that's arisen in the field of kidney donation as well. Um, and we have a, a, a several problems there. Um, of course, we know that sort of BME AME population is particularly vulnerable to, to kidney disease. And indeed, it does seem that they are also more vulnerable to COVID. So that raises all sorts of complex ethical issues as to whether a group of people who are actually likely to suffer more serious adverse consequences from the from the from 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 being participating in a challenge trial should should be encouraged. So Diversity is good, but 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 there are risks as well, and it does raise some other complicated questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Paul. Um, and yeah, if if any journalists uh, would like to ask any other questions, the floor is open. Um, yeah, Rebecca Hartman asks how One Day Sooner is funded. Um, I, I can take this one. So One Day Sooner is funded by grant writing organizations, other nonprofits. So uh, the, the bulk of our money comes from the Open Philanthropy Project. Uh, we received $500,000 uh, from, from Open Phil uh, to, uh, for, for our operating expenses, as well as I believe $200,000 uh, from the Packard Foundation, which is another nonprofit. Um, and that money is to pay for uh, right now uh, three full-time staff, as well as several uh, part-time contractors. Um, myself as communications director, Josh as executive director, and uh, Julia, who, who's not on this call, who's our director of operations and organizing. And um, in addition, yeah, we, we don't accept, or we, we have not taken any money from, from pharmaceutical companies and are quite proud of that. Um, it, is, it is very much a grassroots organization that's funded by other nonprofits. Uh, Charlotte Gardner asks, are your volunteers involved in the challenge dosing trials? And can you again specify which vaccine contenders have moved forward with viral strains for the dosing trials? Only Johnson Johnson and the National Institutes of Health. Any more to comment re-Oxford or Imperial's efforts? Uh, yeah, Josh, do you want to speak about the... Yep. the um, okay, so for the viral strains, um, yeah, so, so that's, um, you know, that, that's just what's been publicly reported. So Johnson & Johnson, NIH, um, uh, have both been developing challenge strains, and um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, then the other piece um, are the challenge volunteers involved in the dosing trials. So, so these trials are not happening yet. They're they're those, they're challenge studies of their own, um, and they would need to happen before a vaccine study. Um, and so, I would. Um, yeah, and so we, we expect that, our, that um, some of our volunteers will participate in those studies, but since those studies haven't been uh, approved yet, people, volunteers haven't been, um, haven't been recruited. And also, uh, were there any other, other experts, particularly any of our ethicists, that wanted to comment on the, um, the diversity in, um, uh, in challenge studies? Comment briefly that and I could comment so much Paul's comments about vulnerable populations and that is a thicket for um, people of color 
And at the same time, I think the premise here, which a fully uh, consent means, is that people who volunteer for this trial are fully aware both of their vulnerabilities and the authority of their consent. Their information, our information, would certainly have the potential to be um, more widely ranging and helpful for um, developing therapies for minority, vulnerable, underserved populations. But at the same time, it is important to consider the um, individual ethic as operating fully and intentionally in the process by itself. And so representing a group as a person of color in a trial is as important as being an individual who has decided to volunteer for a trial like this. And it is critical that this kind of conversation be fully engaged by both the participants and the, those who are executing the trial. And the public information around this has to be clear and unambiguous, in my judgment. Um, Dan, I believe you are muted. Sorry, bad habit. Uh, the, uh, the reasons why there's um, a problem with recruiting uh, minority members for these trials uh, are complex and not fully understood. Some of it seems to um, reflect a feeling that the, uh, they've been left out of the medical system and uh, the, uh, uh, in the past, and especially the, the references to Tuske the Tuskegee trials, uh, they've been victimized uh, when they participated in research in the past. Uh, but that may be combined with some misinformation about the current um, trials. For example, even the suggestion that um, what uh, One Day Sooner is advocating is a smokescreen for uh, imposing uh, 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 um, the uh, deliberate infection of uh, volunteers without their knowing it. So um, uh, this is a case where uh, reaching out to the community, accepting and, and uh, um, fully embracing the, the uh, legitimate grievances that they have uh, with regard to the past, but also correcting misinformation currently is urgent. And I, I, I'm personally uh, looking uh, to, uh, to some of our um, extremely capable um, minority uh, students and colleagues, uh, for example, at Harvard, uh, to take the lead in some of this. How effective they can be, we don't know, but uh, I, I certainly applaud their efforts. Thanks so much, Professor Rickler. Uh, uh, Nir, if you were going to add something, um, now's a good time. I think I'm, I'll forgo this one. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Um, great. So, so the next question um, is from Nicola Hill. Do you know why the Financial Times reported that the UK government announced its plans now? Didn't we know this before? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, what was on the record uh, before, it was not that the UK government was funding human challenge studies. And so that, uh, what, what was reported out by the Financial Times and the Telegraph, was the big breaking news, which is that the UK government is indeed uh, fun funding challenge studies that are, that are set to take place in January. Um, so while there, 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 there was no previous reporting, and I think, um, we, yeah, we didn't know that information before, at least to, to my knowledge of what was on the record. Um, yeah, the, the floor is open for any additional questions from journalists. Uh, next question is, is there an update on One Day Sooner's open letter to the NIH director? Is a trial being planned in the US or funded by the government? So I'll uh, take that one. Um, so uh, we don't have a particular update on the NIH open letter specifically. Um, we have asked for the NIH to um, publish his suggested protocol um, to do challenge studies because we think it's, it's important to understand, you know, for the public to understand what could these studies look like. And when we're kind of considering, you know, should, should they go forward? Um, you know, in terms of updates, I think it is an important update that the NIH announced recently that their challenge strain is, is likely to be ready by December. And so that to us increases the urgency of having a publicly available protocol because we think that it's important that, you know, if the, the virus is going to be ready in December, um, that the studies begin in December if they're going to be useful. 
Um, we know we've had some disagreements with um, the NIH, particularly publicly, on whether um, a so-called rescue therapy uh, is needed um, before moving forward with challenge studies. Um, but we think that there's a number of therapies uh, with evidence now that um, do meaningfully decrease the, the chance of adverse outcomes um, from SARS-CoV-2, particularly the monoclonal antibody um, that Eli Lilly has been developing, um, but also some of the steroidal therapies. Uh, and we, so we think that you know, even if the standard is having a, a so-called rescue therapy, um, we think that that standard may be met right now uh, and is very possibly going to be met by December. And so we would like to have um, uh, something you know, kind of public from the NIH of, of what would a study look like if that's gonna be done. Um, but unfortunately, we have not gotten any sort of formal response um, from Dr. Collins uh, in our, our kind of meeting request to, to him or in our open letter to them specifically. Um, but we are glad to see the NIH moving forward with preparations and hope that they will um, initiate a, a protocol um, that could be ready for implementation when the viral strain is, uh, is ready for use. Uh, sorry, so I think AB's uh, uh, internet just went out. Um, so what uh, other questions um, do uh, people have? Uh, to Nicola's question of, is the timeline for January based on the assumption that phase three trials are completed, will this run alongside? Um, so, you know, the short answer is I don't know because I haven't, you know, talked to anyone in the British government about, uh, about that particular timeline. Um, my understanding would be that these, that these efforts would be parallel and run separately than the phase threes um, because the, the idea of testing vaccines in a challenge study that either could begin on its own in January or, or a challenge study for infectious dosing study in, in January, which I think might be more likely, um, is to be testing a number of vaccine candidates and these so-called second generation of vaccines, where the idea is um, that, you know, for example, uh, we're, well, I think there's two things. One, because we want to have as many vaccines proven as possible so we can have the broadest supply possible. Um, but two, you know, it's very, you know, it's, it's unlikely that the first candidate to kind of get across the finish line and prove some effectiveness, that's going to be the best candidate we're ever going to develop, um, either from an effectiveness perspective, uh, possibly a safety perspective, but also a convenience perspective. Um, and so I think that uh, the hope is, you know, maybe that in some of the first candidates might be 60% effective. Um, and then the later candidates, you know, that you can help uh, use challenge studies to develop could be 80% effective or more, just to throw out a couple sort of uh, random numbers. And the other thing that, that later um, vaccine candidates might have um, that most that the that all the, the candidates currently in phase three don't have is um, one, uh, that they could be perhaps delivered without a booster. Uh, well, the Johnson & Johnson candidate about to enter phase three doesn't have a booster, uh, but that could be, could be valuable, a one dose vaccine. Um, two, uh, some of the candidates early in development have very significant what are called cold chain requirements um, and have to be kept at sub-zero temperatures and, and later vaccines ideally wouldn't. Um, and three, you know, ideally you'd have a vaccine that could be delivered orally instead of by a shot um, and that could be possible in, in a second generation. Uh, so there's a number of ways that vaccines that you could have um, better and better vaccines over time and challenge studies can help you develop that. So I think they would be running in parallel and not be um, uh, beholden to what happens with the phase threes. Obviously, if the news is very bad and the, phase, the current candidates in phase three um, don't prove to be effective, that obviously increases the urgency and motivation to, to do challenge studies. And that's why we think it's valuable to, to be doing the preparation work now. Um, so in case something uh, were unfortunately to go wrong, that we would have these um, available as soon as possible. Uh, and I think AB uh, might be back. I am back, sorry about that. My, my Zoom crashed, uh, thanks so much, Josh, for, for picking it up there. Um, yeah, so we do have 10 more minutes for, for journalist Q&A, um, if there are any additional questions. And uh, Josh, we're gonna go. Oh, I was just going to ask if, if, if um, any of our experts or challenge volunteers had any um, final thoughts they wanted to offer um, based on the discussion uh, so far. Uh, here's a question for the journalist to just ponder. Uh, one day sooner uh, arose 
uh, in the face of uh, uh, a great threat to the, the human race, this uh, global pandemic. Um, and uh, but as it's gotten underway and as it's uh, addressed a, a wider range of issues, you've probably been able to d detect that there's thinking afoot about how to expand this kind of um, participation and research on a, on a broader scale uh, in different kinds of uh, avenues of research and so on. So that this may become, uh, it might, uh, it's under consideration anyway, that this will become a, a sort of more regular feature, something we might encounter in lots of kinds of trials. And so as journalists, you might think about um, uh, the interest of your readers in pondering not only uh, what many of us see as a heroic response to a terrible immediate threat, but also uh, a, 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 a somewhat something of a change in uh, standing policy on uh, development of vaccines and pharmaceuticals. Thanks, Dan. Uh, any other last thoughts? Yeah, if there are no other thoughts, then uh, we could we could wrap up a bit early. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for for taking the time um, to to participate in in, the, in this press conference. Um, thank you to to our volunteers for for showing up um, and speaking about the perspectives and and to experts to for sharing sharing your perspective on challenge trials as well. Thank you to journalists for for covering um, this very important issue. Um, yeah, th thanks everyone for your time. Thank you. Bye bye.